Amen. If you'll remain standing for the reading of God's Word as we return to Acts chapter 7 this morning, we're going to continue to look at Stephen's sermon. Having read through it all last Sunday, we will not uh, repeat to read it all, but we will read the end of his sermon starting in verse 51 to the end of his chapter. I would encourage you this morning, if you do not have your Bibles, turn to the Pew Bible in front of you and read with us this morning. Beginning in verse 51, you stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one, whom you have now betrayed and murdered. You received the laws delivered by angels and did not keep it. Now when they heard these things, they were enraged, and they ground their teeth at him. But he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God, and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens open, and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears, and rushed together at him. Then they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul, and as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Thus far, the reading of God's holy word. You may be seated. I love history. If I'm going to read a book or watch a movie for entertainment purposes, my preference is always the same. I'd rather read or watch one that is set in a historical setting, depicting or describing some events from the history or someone's life. To me, it is fascinating to see how individuals, either rightly or wrongly, handled a particular situation. And you can learn about it, and not only learn about it, but learn from it. And so the old saying is true, that those that do not learn from the past are doomed to repeat it. It's not that history is cyclical, but because you cannot learn from the future, because it has not happened, we must therefore learn from the past, because that is indeed the best indication of what will happen in the future. The best way to respond what is happening right now in the present and even to shape the future. Well, as we read Stephen's sermon, it is truly a justification of all history and indeed the need for it. But in particular, it is the justification for revealed history, holy history, the history of God's people, also known as church history. And what Stephen is doing is just that. He's not just piecing together good Bible stories for a Sunday school class. No, this is the one story of how God has moved and acted in the past. Indeed, how he has brought about redemption for a hell-deserving world. And yet what is incredible and what Stephen recounts is despite God's gracious and abundant work, the response of mankind has been less than enthusiastic. In fact, it has been downright shameful and sinful because God has gone out of his way. He has condescended to make redemption not only a possibility but a reality. And yet mankind's response at the very best, has been indifference and at worst, hostility and rejection. And what Stephen is saying in his sermon is that is not just true of the nations out there somewhere. That is true of God's own people, the people that are called by God and have God's name upon them. That is the stark reality that should somewhat scare us and put a shiver down our spine this morning because we too call ourselves God's people. 
But do our hearts accept or do they reject the revelation that has been given to them? That is the question before us this morning as we return to Stephen's sermon, as we began looking at it last week. We saw that Stephen is addressing his accusers and specifically the the two accusations that were laid out that he was charged with in chapter 6. And those accusations were that this man continues to speak against the holy place, i.e. the temple, and that this Jesus of Nazareth, which he teaches and preaches about, will change and destroy our customs. In other words, Jesus is changing everything. And what we began to see last week is that Stephen begins to turn the tables on his accusers and in fact says that you do not understand that God has never been confined to a holy place. God worked in all times and in all places. And in fact, the majority of God's work of redemption was outside of the land of Israel. It was not contained and never has been in a temple. And so we saw that Stephen recounts that God met Abraham in Mesopotamia and Joseph in Egypt and Moses in Midian and our fathers in the wilderness and that God indeed did not dwell in a temple but a tent for over 400 years. And even when the temple was built by Solomon, Solomon knew that God could not and would not be contained in a house. Stephen's point is that it's never been about the land. It's never been about the temple. But rather, those are physical things that point to a spiritual reality. That those represent the invisible God. And what Stephen says is that you have replaced the reality with the symbol. And so Stephen says your faith is in a place and not in God. Little did Stephen or his hearers know that in a few short decades, that symbol of the temple would be permanently removed at the destruction of Jerusalem, never to be built again. And it further demonstrates Stephen's point that our faith has never been in a place as holy as a place it might have been. Our, pl- our faith is in a holy God. And that is what our fathers look to. That was the faith of Abraham and Joseph and Moses and David. They had none of these physical, tangible realities that the Jews were boasting in. And they didn't need them. Why? Because they had God. And that was enough for them. And the question that we looked at last week and we return to this week, is it enough for us? If you strip it down and talk about faith and life, can we say if we have God, then we have enough? In fact, we have all that we need. As we just sang in that wonderful spiritual hymn, Give me Jesus. You can have all the rest. Give me Jesus. I hope that is your faith this morning. And it is true of you even in increasing measure. Well, that is the first lesson of Stephen, but there is a second. And what Stephen wants to point out in his sermon is that there has been the rejection of the Holy One. And what Stephen does in his sermon and throughout it demonstrates this pattern that has been repeated again and again. It is a pattern of rejection. And it starts with Abraham, the father of the faithful, the model of faith, we would say. But that does not mean that Abraham did not struggle. In fact, the Lord tested him and tested him strongly a test that I can quite confidently say that none of us would have kept. None of us would have 
passed. We would have all failed. We are told about this test in verse 5 of chapter 7. It says that God gave Abraham no inheritance in it, that is, no inheritance in the land, not even a foot's length, but promised to give it to him as a possession and to his offspring after him, though he had no child. You remember the call of Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, there in Mesopotamia, that God said to Abraham, go from your country and your kindred because I am going to show you another land. There I will make your name great and make you into a great nation. Just hearing that, you would say, that sounds good, a great name, a great nation. Show me where I need to go, Lord. But what Stephen is saying is, even though God gave him that promise, he never gave him the land that he showed him. In fact, it says there that he did not even have a foot's length of it. No place where his foot fell could he say that he owned that land. And in fact, even more than that, he gave him no descendants. Those descendants that he said would inherit this land. He gave him no children and would not give them any children, in fact, for several decades. Abraham and Sarah only had the word of God. They only had the promise of God. And you know the rest of the story, that Abraham and Sarah got tired of waiting, and they took matters into their own hands. And Sarah gave Hagar to Abraham, and she gave birth to a son, but not the son, not the promised son, rather it was Ishmael. And so Abraham and Sarah, through their actions, rejected the promise of God. They did not believe that God would provide for them, so they provided for themselves. It was a tragic, tragic sin. And yet, what is amazing, what Stephen says is that God still fulfilled his promise. God still sent the promised son, one born of Sarah, As the author of Hebrews says, one that was sent to them even while they were as good as dead. When it was humanly possible, not possible for them to conceive. God worked supernaturally to give them a son. And so what Stephen is saying is that we have a pattern laid out for us that there is a promise, there is a rejection, and then there is a fulfillment of that promise despite the rejection. We see that again with the life of Joseph, favored by his father, Jacob, that he was the the firstborn of his beloved Rachel, who could not conceive for, for many years. And so Joseph, like Isaac, was a bit of a miraculous child. And because he was favored by his father, Isaac, he was given special privileges. But he was not only favored by his father, he was chosen by God to be a leader, to be a savior type to his brother. And you remember that God gave Joseph two dreams that all of his brothers would bow down to him that he would be a rescuer, that he would be a redeemer for his brothers. But yet, what was their reaction when they heard those dreams? It was anger. It was rage. You read of it in verse 9 of chapter 7, and the patriarchs, jealous of Joseph, sold him into Egypt. They were angry, jealous. They would have killed their brother Joseph Instead, they sold him, but that was a part of the plan so that he would be in a position to rescue and save his brothers. And there's something very subtle that Stephen says. When he says, verse 12, but when Jacob heard that there was grain in Egypt, he sent out our fathers on their first visits. 
But it was on the second visit, Joseph made himself known to his brothers, and Joseph's family became known to Pharaoh. Do you see what he is saying? He's saying that the brothers missed who he was on the first visit. It wasn't until the second visit did they fully understand who he was because he fully made himself known. Do you see how it is a foreshadowing of the Lord Jesus Christ that on his first visitation, the brothers missed who he was? But on the second visitation, there will be no doubts of who this one truly is. But again, we see that Joseph was a savior type for his brethren. And so again, you see this repeated pattern of promise, rejection, and fulfillment. And we can go on to talk about Moses, and we see the exact same thing that Moses, like Isaac, like Joseph, was miraculously born, or at least miraculously allowed to be born because of the Egyptian maidservants who it says were moved by the fear of God more than the fear of man. And they protected Moses from the edicts of Pharaoh to kill all the Israelite male children. And so it says in verse 20 that Moses was born and he was beautiful in God's sight. Verse 22, it says that he was brought up in Pharaoh's home, instructed in all wisdom of the Egyptians and mighty in word and deed. And you would think that the Israelites would have seen the divine hand upon this one. They would have thought that, you know what, there's something different about Moses. There's something special. There's something God-like about this one. But again, that is not what took place as we read on. It says in verse 23 that when he was 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brothers, the children of Israel. And seeing one of them being wrong, he defended the oppressed man and avenged him by striking down the Egyptian. He supposed that his brother would understand that God was giving them salvation by his hand, but they did not understand. Do you hear what Stephen is saying? That even Moses thought that they would understand that they would receive him, that they would know that he was the deliverer, the one that they had been praying for, but it says they did not understand. They rejected the salvation that God was giving them. And in fact, it goes on to say, and on the following day, he appeared to them and saw that there were two that were quarreling and tried to reconcile them, saying, men, you are brothers. Why do you wrong each other? But the man who was wronging his neighbor thrust him aside, saying, who made you? a ruler and judge over us. Do you want to kill me as you killed the Egyptian yesterday? And at this retort, Moses fled and became an exile in the land of Midian. You see what is taking place again and again, that God is sending a deliverer, and yet the people reject it. Moses had to flee to Midian But there in Midian, God was faithful to call again, to tell Moses that he needed to go back because he needed to rescue and redeem his people, which Moses, in fact, did in verse 36. It says, this man led them out, performing wonders and signs in Egypt at the Red Sea and in the wilderness for 40 years. And so you see the promise, the rejection, and then the fulfillments And then we have a whole nother round of it. Look at verse 37 and 41. I don't even need to explain it. You have seen the pattern so often that this one who was in the congregation of the wilderness with the angel who spoke to him at Mount Sinai and with our fathers, he received living oracles to give to us. But notice verse 39. Our fathers refused to obey him but thrust him aside And in their hearts, they turned to Egypt, saying to Aaron, make for for us gods who will go before us. And for this Moses who led us out from the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. They made a calf in those days and offered a sacrifice to the idols and were rejoicing in the works of their hands. Again, a promise and yet a rejection. And so the pattern is repeated again and again 
and again that this is what has always happened. Stephen, in fact, makes it very personal. And at the very end of the sermon, says that you are no different. You are just like your fathers. You are stiff-necked. A charge that was made first by the Lord upon the people of Israel when they were making that golden calf in the wilderness. And the Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people. And behold, it is a stiff-necked people. That is a farming term. It's when the ox or the ass bows up its neck and resists resists the, the yoke being put upon them. And the Lord, looking at the people in the wilderness, making this own God their very own idol, and Stephen, looking at this people, applies the very same term and says, you are no different. You have missed the mark completely. You have worshiped another. You have thrown off the yoke of our Lord, even though this Lord said to you, come to me, for my yoke is easy. My burden is light. And in fact, you said, no, no, we do not want your yoke, O Lord. We want our own yoke, the yoke of the law. You are a stiff-necked people. You are uncircumcised in heart and ears. You are circumcised in the flesh, but you are not circumcised where it matters. You've acted no different than the Gentiles. Your religiosity is merely outward, outward conformity and is not of the heart. It is not of the mind. You have always resisted the Holy Spirit. You have resisted the work of God. You have resisted his redemption. You have rejected the Redeemer, the one that was sent to you again and again and again, and this one that was sending salvation. Just like Abraham and Sarah rejected the promised son, just like the patriarchs rejected Joseph, just like Israel rejected Moses, not once but twice. And in fact, in verse 52, Stephen says, and I don't even have time to talk about the prophets, whom your fathers persecuted and murdered. And then he goes for the jugular, where he takes all of this from the past, and makes it very present and says, just as your fathers have done, so do you. That you, when the prophet, when the promised one came, the Messiah, the Lord's salvation, the righteous one came, what did you do? You betrayed and murdered. And there is no defense There is no answer. And here at the end of Stephen's sermon, Stephen separates himself from his brothers, those that he called fathers and brothers at the beginning of this sermon. He says, that your fathers were unbelieving, and so are you. What a sermon. What a speech, what an indictment. And yet, what was the response? Were they convicted? Did they believe? Did they say, you're right. You understand our history better than we understand it. No, it's none of these things. In fact, it says in verse 54 that they became enraged. Literally, the Greek says that they were cut to the heart. You've heard that term before in Acts. It's in Acts chapter 2. At the end of Peter's preaching at Pentecost, it says that those that heard Peter's sermon were cut to the heart. But this is a very different cut to the heart. That was a cutting of the heart of conviction and of belief. But it says here that they were not cut to the heart in that way, but rather they were cut to the heart with rage and fury and anger. It was not of belief, but rather of further hardening of hearts. 
And you might ask the question when you see these two sermons put together, why was it one way with Peter and another way with Stephen? Was it because Peter was a, a better preacher? No, what I think you're seeing here is that you have two responses to the preached word. That the word of God, we are told in the scripture, never returns void, ever. Meaning that when it goes out, it either finds fertile ground and it is implanted in hearts that spring forth fruit 30, 60, 100 fold, or it finds hardened soil and a hardened heart. And that rejection of that preached word hardens either further. The word of God is always effectual, and it has very different results. So much so that as the saying goes, the same sun which melts wax, hardens clay. And the same gospel, which melts some persons to repentance, hardens others in their sin. Do you hear that there is always a response in the preaching of God's word? And that it is the prerogative of the Spirit to either bring about faith, bring about belief, or bring about a further hardening. And that is exactly what happens, sadly, tragically, in this sermon, that it hardened so much so that it says that those that heard it ground their teeth, blocked up their ears, and rushed Stephen collectively, dragging him out of town so that they could deal with him as what they thought he was, as a blasphemer, picking up stones to hurl at his head. They so hated the message that they kill the messenger. How about you this morning? The message is still the same today. Even though Stephen does not stand before you, Jesus Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit and the testimony of his word, stands this day, and the message still remains So you can reject me, you can dislike me, you can murder me, although I hope that you don't, but if you did, that's fine. You can remove the messenger, but you can never, ever remove the message. The message is still true today, and it still comes with that same conviction. It still comes home to you and me that mankind has constantly and continually rejected the redemption of God. Though God has promised, though God has worked, man at best has been resistant and at worst has been hostile to the point of murder, which is ultimately seen in the murder and death of Christ upon the cross. See, the pattern of Scripture was to say that we are no different. That because of the love of self, because of the love of sin, we have resisted. We have rejected the salvation of God. We have betrayed and murdered the righteous one, that we are the sniff neck, the uncircumcised of heart and mind that have been resistant to the work of God. And it might be easy to say, well, that's not me, Pastor. That is not me. No, that is you. And until you understand that you do not understand the reality of your sin and the reality of your rebellion against God, but, and praise God that there is a but, Despite man's hard-heartedness, despite us being so stiff-necked, the pattern of God is to fulfill his promises despite our continual rejected and hard-heartedness. That God sent his son, though the pattern was clearly seen, that just as they rejected the others, just as they rejected the servants, so too they would reject the son And yet, God in his grace and in his mercy still sent his son, knowing exactly, knowing fully what was going to happen when he sent him, 
Why? Because God is the one that always fulfills his promises, even though that it meant the humiliation and the death of his very own son. God sent his son into a hostile and wicked world, and we are the hostile ones. We are the wicked ones. Why? Why would he do such a thing as that? So that we may be saved. It's the only possibility of redemption. There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Do you see it? The pattern is so clear and evident. It is grace upon grace upon grace upon grace upon those that do not deserve it. That is our God. That is the love in which he has loved us despite our sin, despite our hard-heartedness. And the opportunity this morning is no different. It is an opportunity of salvation that is held out again and again to repent and believe in this Savior, this Jesus Christ, this one that was sent for our redemption. As I said today, there's no difference. Will you believe? Will you repent? Will you trust? Will your faith grow? Otherwise, if you don't, if that is not the way that you respond, the scripture is very clear that you will only become that much more hard-hearted. That the next time that the gospel is preached, you'll resist it even more and then more and more all the way to your eternal destruction. See, I have a fear, a great fear, and it relates to my own children. That those that have grown up in a Christian home, though their father be a pastor, that they would not believe and that is why there is continually in our home, maybe not daily, but definitely weekly, questions that are posed to them, very specific questions. Do you love the Lord? Will you follow him all the days of your life? Will you give your life to Christ no matter if the world goes against you? Those questions are posed so much that many might believe that I am a Baptist preacher at home because there is constant altar calls. Because there is nothing that would crush me more than for them to hear their father preach thousands of times and for them not to believe, only for them to walk away from the faith, from the only means of salvation. And that same fear applies to all of you. As your pastor, though Christ would be preached every Sunday, Though Christ would be present like he is today, that he would be in your midst, and yet you would miss him. That you would reject him. Maybe not in hostility like those on that day, but through mere indifference, which is just as hell deserving and worthy as hostility. That you would not believe. That you would not see. You would not have a vision like Stephen did on that day. A vision that is so incredibly beautiful. When it says in verse 55 that he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. That right there before his death, he saw the heavens open up. And he was given this glorious vision of Jesus high and lifted up, here standing. Why is he standing? Oftentimes we confess that he's seated at the right hand of God. Stephen sees him standing. Why? Because he sees one of his own. Jesus sees one of his own in need. He sees one of his brethren suffering. And he stands in defense, stands to rescue this one. And the Lord Jesus Christ does the same for each and every one of you that he calls brethren. Just as we saw last 
Sunday night if you were with us in Psalm 34. David says that many are the afflictions of the righteous. That is true, isn't it? Many are the afflictions of the righteous. Stephen would bear witness to that, to the point of his death. His stones were hurled at his head and then he had this terrible, gruesome death. But you must not forget the second part of that statement. Yes, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord, Yahweh, delivers him out of them all. But Jesus delivers his righteous ones out of all of the afflictions. That is exactly what we see here, that the Lord Jesus Christ stands to rescue and deliver his own. What a vision. What a picture. But isn't it the picture that we see every Sunday as we gather together as we worship? Maybe not in a supernatural way like Stephen had on that day, but by faith we see Christ high and lifted up. And we see Jesus Christ as the Savior, as the rescuer, as the redeemer of his people. And I hope and pray that as I finish my journey in this life and as you finish yours, that this would be the vision that we have of Jesus standing to come and rescue and deliver his own. Because I tell you, it won't be long. That we either will go to be with the Lord or the Lord will come to be with us. And when he does, all of mankind will say, behold, I see the heavens open up and the Son of Man coming. What a glorious day that will be. It will be a day of glory and salvation or a day of condemnation and judgment. And that will be determined not then, but today. Today, my friends, is the day of salvation. Repent and believe. Trust in Jesus Christ that he would be your only hope, your only way of salvation. For Christ has come to rescue and redeem. I'll finish with this. The distinguishing feature of this church is this window behind me. And I know that as you look through that window, you see the sky, and on most days you see the clouds, and sometimes I see you looking out through that, gazing off as I preach, and watching birds flutter by, and today, no doubt, seeing if the snow is still falling. That's okay. But what I want you not to miss is what's before that window. It's the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's such a beautiful symbol. That's why it's the logo of our church, because glory awaits, my friends. But it happens through the cross. But those that pick up their cross and follow him, that believe in the redemption of the Lord Jesus Christ upon that cross, glory awaits. And would we look to that glory with greater eagerness and expectation than we have even looked for the snow falling on this day. Would there be such joy and such glory, such expectation for us to see Jesus? Oh, to live in faith, to die in faith, and one day to see Jesus face to face. I tell you, there is nothing greater. So this morning, do you believe? Do you see? My prayer is that you would. Let us pray. Our gracious God and Heavenly Father, we thank you for this glorious sermon of Stephen's. Lord, we cannot do it adequately. Because we know it was full of truth and full of the Holy Spirit. And so, Lord, would you apply those same words to our hearts this morning that we would truly repent and believe that we would not be stiff-necked, that we would not resist the Holy Spirit, but that we would trust and believe and love this righteous one who was betrayed and murdered by our hands, but yet is now given as the most gracious and wonderful gift that all mankind could receive. 
And so would we receive that gift this day by grace, through faith. We pray it in Christ. Amen.